The Humber region, situated on the eastern coast of northern England, is home to the UK's largest industrial cluster and the largest emitter of CO2. An ambitious plan by the UK's leading energy provider Equinor and its partners is underway to transform the region into the world's first net zero industrial hub and unlock a cutting edge hydrogen economy that will play a major role in helping the UK reach net zero. The first step to achieving a zero carbon Humber region is the H2H Solten project led by Equinor, who aim to build the world's largest hydrogen production plant with carbon capture and storage technology at the Solten Chem The Humber region, situated on the eastern coast of northern England, is home to the UK's largest industrial cluster and the largest emitter of CO2. An ambitious plan by the UK's leading energy provider Equinor and its partners is underway to transform the region into the world's first net zero industrial hub and unlock a cutting edge hydrogen economy that will play a major role in helping the UK reach net zero. The first step to achieving a zero carbon Humber region is the H2H Solten project led by Equinor, who aim to build the world's largest hydrogen production plant with carbon capture and storage technology at the Solten Chemicals Park by 2026. Drawing on Equinor's two decades of experience, this plant will produce hydrogen from natural gas while capturing at least 95% of all CO2. These emissions will travel by pipeline under the North Sea to a giant aquifer where they'll be permanently stored. CO2 emissions will fall by 900,000 tonnes per year as Sultan's industrial plants switch over to hydrogen and power generation moves to a 30% hydrogen fuel blend. Looking to the future, Equinor and its partners hope to deliver a zero-carbon Humber cluster by 2040 as more hydrogen plants are built, including hydrogen from renewable power, and industries across the region plug into a new pipeline network, allowing them to fuel switch or capture their carbon. Growth opportunities will emerge as the Humber exports hydrogen and imports CO2 from other parts of the UK and beyond. This landmark project has the potential to put the Humber at the heart of Britain's energy transition and help kickstart a global hydrogen economy. The Humber region, situated on the eastern coast of northern England, is home to the UK's largest industrial cluster and the largest emitter of CO2. An ambitious plan by the UK's leading energy provider Equinor and its partners is underway to transform the region into the world's first net zero industrial hub and unlock a cutting edge hydrogen economy that will play a major role in helping the UK reach net zero. The first step to achieving a zero carbon Humber region is the H2H Solten project led by Equinor, who aim to build the world's largest hydrogen production plant with carbon capture and storage technology at the Solten Chemicals Park by 2026. Drawing on Equinor's two decades of experience, this plant will produce hydrogen from natural gas while capturing at least 95% of all CO2. These emissions will travel by pipeline under the North Sea to a giant aquifer where they'll be permanently stored. CO2 emissions will fall by 900,000 tonnes per year as Solten's industrial plants switch over to hydrogen and power generation moves to a 30% hydrogen fuel blend. Looking to the future, Equinor and its partners hope to deliver a zero carbon Humber cluster by 2040 as more hydrogen plants are built, including hydrogen from renewable power, and industries across the region plug into a new pipeline network, allowing them to fuel switch or capture their carbon. 
growth opportunities will emerge as the Humber exports hydrogen and imports CO2 from other parts of the UK and beyond. This landmark project has the potential to put the Humber at the heart of Britain's energy transition and help kickstart a global hydrogen economy. So hi everyone, welcome to our third event of the, the term. So today we are going to be discussing a topic that has featured prominently in the past year, basically how hydrogen is critical to a net zero target. Specifically, we are going to be discussing blue hydrogen, a technology which has divided some economies, some environmentalists, sorry. So here, natural gas is actually turned into hydrogen with the subsequent carbon emissions captured and stored. Interestingly, the UK's Committee on Climate Change has actually projected that 80% of hydrogen production in 2050 will be from this gas reformation with carbon capture process. However, there are some concerns with the potential for carbon emissions through leakages. So today, we are very glad to have with us Al Cook to speak on this technology. Al Cook is the Executive Vice President for Development and Production International at Equinor. In that role, he also leads global strategy sustainability and business development. In the UK, Equinor is involved in a significant number of net zero projects. This includes offshore and floating wind, as well as the blue hydrogen project you might have seen in the opening video, and which I'm sure he'll talk to you more about. So as always, feel free to add any questions you have in the comment section. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Al. Thanks very much, Sylvester, and thanks for the kind introduction. Um, what I'd like to do today is, I think we've got about an hour together, so I'd like to speak for almost half of that and then open up for questions and, uh, and, and, and discussion points. And what I'd like to do, if it's all right with, with you, Sylvester, and with everyone, is I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about the balance as energy companies make the energy transition as we go from oil and gas world to a hydrogen and renewable world, and then deep dive into the hydrogen question that, that you asked. Um, if I might, I'll start off by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Al Cook. As Sylvester said, I, um, I'm the um, Executive Vice President uh, at Equinor, um, covering our international business. Um, it doesn't feel like that long ago that I was at university. I'm 45 years old now, so that makes it about 20, 24 years, I guess. Since, since I left. I studied um, geology, geoscience, um, over at, uh, at uh, Cambridge. Um, and, um, and after that went into BP, worked for BP for 20 years well, around the world. And um, then about five years ago, joined Equinor, which um, if you don't know, it is the Norwegian equivalent uh, of BP. Um, and came into this role um, and, um, and currently doing this uh, about, uh, about three years ago. Um, a little word as to who Equinor is beyond the, 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 um, the Norwegian version of, of, um, of BP. Um, we are the Norwegian state energy company. Um, we're two thirds owned by the government, one third privately owned, so it gives us this interesting balance. Uh, we've got about 20,000 people working across about 25 countries around the world. Um, and we started off being called Statoil, and um, that doesn't leave much to the imagination, State Oil. Um, and we started off as Norway's state oil company uh, about 50 years ago. And in recent years, we've made a transformation from being an oil and gas company through to being a much broader energy company. Uh, we've changed our name to reflect that to Equinor, Equi, balance, nor, Norway, you get that. And, um, and we've moved our business as well. And we like to believe that we are the most progressive um, and most climate conscious oil and gas company. And um, as part of that, right now, as I speak, we are leading the um, biggest hydrogen project in Europe. You saw that in the video. Uh, we are leading the biggest wind power project in the United States and we are leading the biggest wind power project in the world, um, here in the UK, actually, a place called Dogger Bank. I'll come on to all of that in, in a minute. And um, 
What I'd like to though begin with is to reflect on a question I often get asked, not least by my 13 year old daughter, which is, Daddy, why do you keep on producing oil and gas when the world needs renewable power and hydrogen? Why don't you just do renewable power and hydrogen? Um, this year and, and over the next year, we in Equinor will spend about 10 billion pounds of, of capital investment, of money. Um, around about three quarters of that will go into oil and gas and around about a quarter of that will go into renewables and hydrogen. So I think there's a, a, a good question out there that my 13-year-old my daughter asks. But I wanted to start by asking you that question. And we're now going to be quite brave, and we're going to try and use a, a tool that collects all the different answers that we get. So bear with us if it all goes hopelessly wrong. But we'd like to ask you a question and, and get things going like that, and then I'll build on the presentation from that. So the question is this. What factors do you think Equinor should consider when balancing investments in oil and gas on the one hand versus renewable energy on the other hand? And with a little bit of luck, if you type in a few answers to that, then um, we should be able to see them on the screen. If that doesn't work, I'll have to hopelessly improvise. But I'll just go silent for a couple of moments while we hopefully begin to get some answers on the screen and, um, and we get a few of your thoughts as to the way we should be balancing this all important question that um, it's not just 13 year old uh, girls that ask it, it's, it's an awful lot of people from um, students such as yourselves to people in governments, to the general population, to the people who indeed work for companies like Equinor. So um, I'll see whether we begin to see whether this tool can work. And thank God it does. So we're beginning to get energy security. So we talk a lot about this. Um, this is about the, the need to ensure that people get energy supplies. It's one of the questions we got a lot, actually, over the past year. When, um, when COVID first hit and when we went into lockdown, the energy minister was pretty quickly um, calling us up and, uh, and, and saying, look, can you still provide energy security to the UK? Um, a second thing that has come up here is carbon emissions. Um, really, really important. And we'll come on to the carbon emissions of oil and gas, as well as the carbon emissions of blue and green hydrogen. I think there's a couple of really important pieces here as well, which are profitability has come up and energy output. One of the things that people don't often appreciate is quite the incredible energy density of oil and gas and quite how many wind turbines you have to have or solar panels you have to have to replace that. It's a monumental um, task as we embark upon the, the energy transition. Use of space is another one. Um, as we look at onshore renewables, an awful lot of people who like renewables energy don't much like the idea of having uh, a wind turbine in their backyard or even a solar farm in their, in their back garden. There's a lot of nimbyism, uh, not in my backyard, uh, about all of this. We've got some points here around technology maturity. We'll come on to that when we talk about hydrogen. Um, we'll talk a lot about the costs of transition as well. Um, the world is geared up um, with an oil and gas infrastructure. And people sometimes say that um, you should um, change your toothbrush every three months. You should change your mobile phone every three years but you change your energy infrastructure every 30 years. And that gives you a bit of a sense of the timeline for, for changing these things. So these answers are, are fantastic, actually, in, um, in terms of, um, in terms of um, what, what you've put up here. And I'm glad also that we also see a few words like emergency. And we are not fearful of using the word climate emergency, climate crisis, and we absolutely um, believe that um, we need to start addressing these things now, not yesterday, and uh, as soon as possible. And I'll come on to that as well. And you can challenge me. Are we doing it fast enough? And uh, what could we do to, to make it even faster? So, look, thanks so much for these, um, for these comments and, um, and points. Um, let me try to give you a sense of the way that we look at this um, in, in Equinor. And what I'd like to do, because this is the Oxford Energy Society, is give it a bit of a UK context. And what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about Equinor in the UK and try and give you a bit of a sense of how here in the UK we balance oil and gas on the one hand and wind and hydrogen 
on the other hand. And the way I'll start this is with a little map that we're going to show and hopefully will appear on your, on your screen anytime soon. And that'll show what we actually do in the UK. As you might have seen in that video, if you're watching early on, uh, we're the UK's leading energy provider. Um, that surprises some people. I often get the question, uh, what do you do? And I say, I work for Equinor. And they say, who is Equinor? And I say, you might not have heard of us. We used to be called Statoil. And they say, who the hell is Statoil? Uh, we are not the, um, the world's leading company in terms of brand recognition in the UK. Some of that is fine by us. Some of that is because we're growing pretty quickly. Um, but we are the UK's leading energy provider. And I'll come on to why, why that is. So what you see here is a map. And what you see in the northern part of this map, particularly in Scotland, is our oil and gas business. You can see fields here with names like Rosebank and Barnacle and Bresse and Mariner and Utgard. And these are some of the, um, the UK's newest oil and gas fields. In fact, the Rosebank field isn't even developed yet, neither is the Bresse field. Mariner has been one of the biggest oil and gas developments in the UK in recent years. That came on stream a couple of years ago. And what we try and do with our oil and gas portfolio in the UK is produce oil and gas with the lowest carbon footprint possible. The other thing we do on oil and gas is round about where you can see Aldborough marked on this map, we import oil and gas from Norway. And altogether, Equinor provides about one third of the oil and one third of the natural gas that, um, that the UK uses on a daily basis. And what we try and do with that, as I say, is make sure we produce that gas with the lowest carbon footprint possible. What does that mean? That means in practice that if you get oil from Equinor, we produce it around about half the global average carbon emissions. So about, about half the CO2 that would normally come with a barrel of oil. If we produce gas, we produce that at around about a quarter of other um, sources of gas, for instance, liquefied natural gas or pipelines from North Africa or, or anything like that. So simply put, we say here in the UK, for as long as the UK needs oil and it needs gas, we will produce it with the lowest carbon footprint of any provider. Now, let me move on next to the parts south of this, and that is our renewables and our hydrogen agenda. So let's start in the very north with High Wind Scotland. This is small, it's only five wind turbines, but it is the world's first floating wind farm. Most wind farms, the wind turbines, are on the bottom of the sea. This is an exciting one because it's the world's first floating. They literally bob up and down in the water off the, um, off the Scottish coast. Then when we come down, you'll see two things called CSS and hydrogen projects. These are our carbon capture and storage, and there are hydrogen projects. And there's two of them. One of them, the northern dot, is called Net Zero Teesside. The other, um, to the south, is called Zero Carbon Humber. And I'd like to um, come on to those in a, middle, in, in, in a minute and tell you a little bit more about those. First, though, I'll come on to our, our wind projects. And I'll talk about four of the dots you can see here. Dudgeon on the bottom, Sheringham Shoal, and then Dogger Bank, um, as well as, as, well as the, um, the fourth dot being High Wind Scotland. Dudgeon and Sheringham Shoal are two of the UK's most important wind farms. They're off the coast of Norfolk, northern Norfolk. We're doubling the size of them at the moment because they've done so well. And they produce clean power into the Norfolk grid. The project that we are really proud of, though, is one that hasn't yet produced a single electron of power. And that is called Dogger Bank. This is the world's largest wind farm. We're doing it in three parts. We're doing it with our partner, SSE. And, um, and this is a project that we took a final investment decision on. That means we, we made the commitment to invest around about £9 billion. Pounds, and we made that commitment um, just a couple of months ago in, um, in November uh, last year. And this is a project that we're now getting underway. The turbines themselves are the biggest turbines you can get in the world, almost as high as the, um, as the um, Eiffel Tower far higher than Big Ben, to give you a sense. Towards the end of last year, I took uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, up to the north of England to show him um, our, our turbines and show how we test 
our turbines. And um, I think even he was pretty impressed by, by the size of these things and by the potential that they have to produce wind power in the UK. The power from Dogger Bank will provide electricity for about five or six million um, UK homes when it's fully up and, and running. Beyond this, we want to do even more uh, wind farms in the UK. The UK is a fantastic place to do wind farms. Um, we have shallow, um, large seas around the island, particularly the North Sea, and um, some large, shallow areas such as Dogger Bank, where we can put uh, wind turbines. It's very windy. Um, if you ever go out there, it's very wavy as well, as I found to my cost when I went out to visit our high wind Scotland uh, wind turbines. I hope if you ever go there, you take plenty of seasickness tablets um, before, you, before you go. And all of this is beginning to change the energy mix in the UK. Just last week, we had a remarkable event. I don't know if you know what that was, but we had uh, a moment last week where the energy that we got from renewable power in the UK was greater than the energy we got from fossil fuels in the UK, and that's coal and gas. More and more, the UK has got rid of coal in the UK. And even in 2019, we had our lowest emissions in the UK as a result of this change. We had our lowest emissions in the UK since the Industrial Revolution, since the 1850s. Um, so that's remarkable. In 2020, of course, we had even lower emissions, and now we're heading for even lower emissions as we cut coal out of the energy mix completely and as we rely more and more on wind um, turbines for our power, and a little bit on, on solar and, and some on hydro as, as well. And this is immensely important as we go forward. And this really brings me on to hydrogen. And I've talked a little bit about oil and gas, I've talked a little bit about wind, and I'd now like to talk a little bit about hydrogen. And as Sylvester said, I think it was the investments that Equinor is making in hydrogen that really um, caught the interest and led to me uh, giving this presentation to the society this evening. So why is it that we need hydrogen at all? So first of all, the wonderful thing about hydrogen, as you probably know, is when you burn it, it produces energy, but it doesn't produce carbon dioxide. It produces water, hydrogen oxide, in a, in a sense, when it's burned. That's the wonderful thing about it. What does hydrogen do that wind and solar and other renewables cannot do? It does two things. First of all, it addresses the problem of intermittency. And secondly, it addresses the problem of intensity. What on earth does that mean? The problem we have with wind and solar power, which are the two renewable power sources that really are gonna drive the energy transition. The problem we have is what happens when the wind isn't blowing, and what happens when the sun, is, sun isn't shining. We had some really long periods towards the end of last year where that happened. We had long windless days and weeks, and we had times when it was cloudy and, um, and there was not enough sunshine to generate much solar power. What happens then? Well, what should not happen is we need to make sure that the UK does not run out of power. It's one thing we've learned is that uh, a lot of people are keen on moving to renewable power, but they're not enthusiastic about having power cuts that could last hours or days or even weeks when wind and solar can't produce the amount of power required. So we need a source of power that can produce electricity when the wind isn't blowing and when the sun isn't shining. At the moment, that source of power is methane. That source of power is natural gas. And that is very, very reliable, but when natural gas, when CH4, when methane is burnt, that produces carbon dioxide. So the first challenge that addresses is, is, um, is intermittency. It makes sure that we, can, um, that we can produce power when the wind isn't blowing and when the sun isn't shining. Ah, oh, but you might say, what about batteries? Why don't we use batteries as a backup for wind turbines instead of hydrogen? That comes with a huge problem, and that is um, cost and scale. If we dedicated all the battery production in the entire world just to back up the UK's wind power, we wouldn't be able to do it. So the sheer amount of space, the sheer amount of batteries, the sheer amount of cost of that means that we couldn't do it. Maybe sometime in the future, um, that will work better. But right now, batteries are simply not able to do that. The second problem that hydrogen addresses is intensity. 
we're not yet able to use wind power or electricity in general to replace hydrocarbons, to replace fossil fuels in some of the most energy intensive industrial uses. You might think this is a little bit niche, but actually a huge amount of the oil and gas in the UK is currently used for this, particularly gas. What do I mean by these industrial sources? I mean things like making cement. I mean things like making steel in blast furnaces. These use incredibly high temperatures in the thousands of degrees in order to um, produce steel, in order to produce cement. And it's industries like this that rely on hydrocarbons at the moment. And we can't supply wind power in order to get these very, very high temperatures, at least not at reasonable costs. So what we need to do is, is, is to replace the gas that currently comes into these blast furnaces, currently comes into these cement kilns, currently comes into these others um, hard to address industrial sectors. We need to change that gas into hydrogen. So how do we go about that? There are three types of hydrogen. Um, in, in simple terms, and we call those grey, blue, and green. Grey hydrogen is hydrogen produced from natural gas, but when we produce it, when we take that CH4 and turn it into H2, we let the carbon dioxide go into the air. That is not good for the environment. It is, though, the way that hydrogen is produced at the moment. Um, we do that ourselves in Norway. Uh, it, what it has done is it has enabled us to become experts on producing hydrogen, but it's not a sustainable way of doing it. The next color is blue. Blue hydrogen is produced from natural gas, but what we do when we produce the natural gas is we take the carbon dioxide that's produced and we take that carbon dioxide and we put it down into reservoirs underneath the ground. And I'll tell you the story of that um, when, we, when, we, um, when we come on to um, talk a little bit more about hydrogen to Humber. The third type of um, hydrogen is green hydrogen, and this is the cleanest of all. Whereas blue hydrogen, you get rid of about 95% of the emissions that you would normally have from methane. Green hydrogen, you get rid of 100% of the emissions. How do you make green hydrogen? You make green hydrogen by taking electricity from renewable sources, let's say a wind farm, and you use that to electrolyze water, and that produces um, a clean source of very, very pure hydrogen. We are doing a project on green hydrogen. We're not doing it in the UK, but we're doing it in the Netherlands. We call it North H2, N-O-R-T-H2. It's a kind of play on words, North H2. And we're working there with a series of partners in order to produce green hydrogen into the Dutch markets. The challenge we have with all of this is, let's say methane costs one pound. Blue hydrogen will cost you about two pounds. And green hydrogen, the cleanest form of all, will cost you about six pounds. Over time, we expect these costs to come down. And we expect that sometime in the 2030s, we might get cost parity, that is equal costs for green hydrogen and blue hydrogen and, and methane. But right now, green hydrogen costs six times as much as methane, blue hydrogen costs about two times as much as, as methane. And that's a big challenge because as we move forward with these projects, someone has to pay for them. We in our energy companies will pay for them um, quite a bit. We will take lower returns on our hydrogen projects than we do on our traditional oil and gas projects. The consumer will have to pay a little bit more as well. They'll have to pay a bit more for clean electricity than they did for um, fossil fuel electricity. But I can't say that I have met many consumers who are very, very enthusiastic about that. So we also have to work with a third group, and that's the government, to bring in some subsidies to get all of this started. It's what we did on wind, and it's been immensely successful, because although wind started off as a very subsidized form of power, today it's able to compete head-to-head, -head, pretty much, with, um, with, uh, with, with fossil fuels and with gas-fired production, as long as the wind's blowing and as long as the sun's shining. So I'm going to come on now to the final part of this is, Right, what are we doing in the UK on all of this? And what are these projects that we are so excited about? And I'll tell you about a couple of them. I'll tell you about Net Zero Teesside, and I'll talk to you about Zero Carbon Humber. And these are two projects, and they
they both use the same site to get rid of the carbon dioxide. You saw it on the video. It's called the Northern Endurance Partnership or the Endurance Platform. And it's a platform where we take carbon dioxide from different sources, from different parts of the UK, and we pipe it offshore and we drill holes into the ground. And in the same way that over decades we've been taking oil and gas out of the ground through wells, we now put carbon dioxide into the ground um, through wells and we store it there safely. Sometimes I get asked, not least by my 13-year-old daughter, are you sure it's safe? Are you sure it's not going to come out? Are you sure it's not going to leak? We've been doing this for about three decades, since the 1990s in Norway. Um, we're probably the most experienced company in the world at using carbon capture and storage. We've been doing it in particular at a field called Snervit in the north, another field called Sleipner. And we've been safe, successfully putting carbon dioxide down there. It hasn't leaked out. It is safe. It is working well. And it is a key source of um, carbon reductions going forward. So that's the platform offshore that's pumping all this carbon dioxide down. And then what we have onshore are two plants. The one in Teesside is a power station and it burns natural gas. And then what we do is at the outlet of the power station where normally we would have carbon dioxide coming into the air, we collect up that carbon dioxide and we pipe it and we take it offshore. What we're doing though in zero carbon Humber, I think is even more exciting. And that is really the future um, for the UK. Here, we take all of this gas coming in from Norway and we put it into an ATR, an autothermal reformer. And we turn that gas into two things. On the one hand, we turn it into hydrogen. And on the other hand, we turn it into carbon dioxide. We then take that carbon dioxide stream and we take it offshore to this northern endurance platform. It's buried down safely under the rocks. And then we take the hydrogen and we begin to do quite exciting things with it. We take some of that hydrogen and we're going to take it into a power station. And we're going to mix it initially with, um, with methane, with natural gas. And about one third hydrogen, two thirds natural gas. And we're going to provide the cleanest source of electricity from a um, power station like this. In, in the UK and possibly in the world. The second thing that we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be pumping hydrogen down the pipelines so that we can take it out into the Humber area where there are lots of factories and blast furnaces and cement kilns and all this heavy industry. It's the biggest heavy industry in the entire UK. And we're gonna take it there and we're gonna enable them to start using hydrogen to make their products, whether they're cement or steel or anything else, they can make their products in a lower carbon um, way, using hydrogen instead of methane to do that. And then what we hope to do beyond that is we hope to start pumping hydrogen into people's homes. Now, people often say, is that safe? And um, will it cost me a load of money? The answer is quite an interesting one. Back in the 1950s, um, you might have heard that the UK used to use a source of gas um, for cookers and for power stations, which was called town gas or coal gas. The interesting thing is, is most of this gas was actually hydrogen. So we've actually tried and tested the use of hydrogen in the UK before we found out that it works. Now, that was very dirty hydrogen. It was produced as a byproduct of coal, but it shows that people can use hydrogen. And what we believe today is that even using existing hobs, such as the one that you might use at uh, home to, uh, to cook on, even using existing boilers, even using existing gas pipelines, we believe we can put in somewhere between 10 and 20% hydrogen molecules to replace those methane molecules. And as we do that, we will make the gas that you use 10 to 20% less carbon intense. It's a first step, it's not all the way, but it is the first time that we can start doing that. And there's a, a company um, in Italy which has started doing this already. It's tested out these limits, 10 to 20%. It seems to be working quite well. And there's even a company that is now using that gas to make pasta. And they put on their packets of pasta, um, the um, carbon, carbon, uh, carbon, reduced carbon pasta. I'm not sure anyone wants to, um, wants to um, make any greater recipes out of that, but they regard that as a selling point for the way they produce pasta. And if the Italians can do that to produce pasta, um, we in Britain can use that 
to, um, to produce uh, boiled potatoes, um, mince pies, and all the things we, we Brits um, have contributed to, uh, to world cuisine. So you, you put all of this together, and, and I'll wrap up on, on this note. Over the last 10 years, natural gas has replaced coal in the UK, and it's enabled the UK to produce its energy needs at the lowest emissions levels we've seen since the 19th century. That's not enough, though. We've got to do more going forward. We as a company have committed to be um, carbon net zero by 2050. The UK has committed to be net zero by 2050. So we need to do an awful lot more together in order to do that. Over the last 10, 10 months, with COVID and with the pandemic, we've seen a remarkable fall in carbon dioxide. It's not enough to get us all the way there, but it is a step. But with that fall, we've seen lockdowns, we've seen travel eliminated, we've seen people lose their jobs, we've seen people go into furloughs. That is not the way that we need to address carbon dioxide, global warming and climate change. What we need to do going forward over the next 10 months, ahead of COP26, is move forward with these projects so that by the time that we have COP26 here in the UK, in Glasgow, later on this year, here in the UK, we want to be able to say as Equinor, we are doing the world's largest wind farm in the UK, and we are doing the world's largest um, hydrogen project, clean hydrogen project in the UK. And even over the next 10 months, we can show how we're springing into action and showing how we need to address the huge challenges going forward. If we're truly gonna go through an energy transition, truly gonna make the world um, lower carbon, and we're going to make the UK and Equinor net zero by 2050. So, Sylvester, I will end it there. I think that leaves almost 25 minutes for, for questions, comments, and uh, and anything else that's on people's minds. Back to you, Sylvester. Yep. Thanks a lot, Al, for that very insightful talk into both Equinor's operations, as well as kind of the opportunities, or as well as the necessity of hydrogen. So, yeah. Um, we'll just wait for, for the audience to kind of um, put in any questions that they have. So to the audience, you can kind of put it in both the YouTube comment section as well as uh, the Facebook comment section. Yeah, and maybe just to kick it off, I'll, I'll just ask a few questions of my own. So Please do. I guess, yeah, the first question that I have is you mentioned that green hydrogen might actually reach cost parity with blue hydrogen in the, the 2030s. So in that case, what would happen to this um, Humber project? What would happen to this yeah, blue hydrogen Humber project? So, so, so that's, a, that's, that's a really good question. And as you can imagine, we're going to be putting about um, three or four billion pounds into this project. So we ask ourselves, is this going to be needed in, in the 2030s? Firstly, um, the, the UK's energy needs are going to grow uh, the UK's power needs, I'm so, sorry, are going to grow over time. So as the UK moves away from oil and gas and moves to electricity, we are going to see incredible increases in power needs in, in the UK. Imagine as we go from all our cars being powered on petrol to being powered on electricity, as we go from people having um, gas boilers to electric boilers, gas heating to electric heating, as everyone moves over to power, it, we're going to have a massive ramp up in, in power needs. So we will need every possible source of power going forward to make the energy transition. Even though you, I, you, you and I write, Sylvester, that green hydrogen will, we hope, reach cost parity with blue hydrogen by the 2030s, that will, of course, be for new projects. So for an up and running project like, um, like um, Zero Carbon Humber and the Hydrogen to Humber uh, plant there, um, we will have already invested that money and we will be able to provide hydrogen to people quite cheaply um, going forward. Just to give you a, a sense of the challenge going forward as we look at green hydrogen, if we look at um, wind power at the moment, uh, the, the UK's leading source of, of renewable power, not only will we have to massively ramp up um, that wind power over time to replace all the power that currently comes from natural gas today. On top of that, we will need to build all enough wind turbines in order to produce green hydrogen. So 
the scale of the energy transition will mean that we we need all clean sources of energy we can get hydro nuclear um wind solar and um blue hydrogen for for many many years to come so that's why we're so confident investing um in this in this technology okay so i guess it's very much about the diversity of the the sources and i think you mentioned um there you mentioned um, electric heating so when it comes to kind of the end use of this hydrogen um does equino actually conduct an analysis of which would be kind of a better way to decarbonize whether we should go down the, the route of air source heat pumps or whether we should kind of introduce hydrogen into our boilers do you actually kind of conduct an analysis of which is the more efficient route i, I think it's all about what happens over time so mm -hmm. um if, if we look into the distant future there's no reason to believe that a combination of renewable power and batteries and perhaps a bit of hydrogen will, will meet all our energy needs. But where we're starting today is a society that is almost completely dependent on oil and gas. So let's take your example of a, of a boiler versus a heat pump. Um, mm -hmm. Going forward, either direct electrical heating um, or heat pumps will undoubtedly be the answer. But right now, we've got to address the fact that um, the vast majority of the UK population have gas boilers and we need to start getting hydrogen rather than methane into those gas boilers to reduce the emissions immediately. So a lot of what we're talking about here, both in terms of blue hydrogen and in terms of, our, of hydrogen into the energy mix, is, is the next interim stage um, of the, the energy transition. If you like, we have the coal age for power, we have the gas age for power, as we reduce carbon, we have the blue hydrogen age, and then we have the green hydrogen and um, and renewable power age. So it's it's part of the transition. Okay, yeah, that's a really nice way to see it, kind of being a mid-term kind of solution. Yeah. So just a few questions from the audience. So Mike actually asked um, whether Equinor flares natural gas in any of your operations. Yes, we do. So let's let's be open about that. Um, we flare less gas than any other oil and gas company of, our, of, a, of a major size in the entire world. Why, why do we do that? Well, first of all, there's two ways where, where, where you could flare gas. The first is when you're exploring and um, you discover oil and gas from the first time and you've simply got nowhere to put the gas. And traditionally, that gets flared. Um, the second way, which... Um, generates the vast, vast majority of the problem we have with climate change is what we call routine flaring. And that is where people will routinely flare gas over time. That's the bit that we're trying to address. The World Bank has set up a really good initiative, which has which they've got companies around the world to sign up to um, from companies, obviously, in Northern Europe, those who are really at the forefront of this, but also companies in the Middle East, companies in Russia, companies in China, and that's to eliminate routine flaring by 2030. I think Mike, you can legitimately ask, 2030, my God, that's a long way away. What we're doing in Equinor is systematically reducing our flaring all the time. Um, we've got two areas where we have particular problems. One's in the UK, one is in um, the US, and we're doing different things for them. What we're doing in the UK is Within the next couple of years, we will find ways of using all of that natural gas uh, to provide power. So that will mean we stop flaring in the UK. In the US, what we're doing is we're building uh, gas pipelines to take away that gas and to actually use it. Um, if you want to horrify yourself, you could um, get a Google map of Texas and look at the Permian and look what it looks like at night and look how much flaring there is of routine gas flared into the air um, just because no one's built the pipelines to, um, to, to take that to market. Completely a waste of the world's natural resources, even if there was no such a thing as climate change. So does Equinor flare natural gas anywhere? Yes, it does. Um, are we going to stop doing that? Yes, we are. Are we at the forefront of the oil and gas industry in terms of doing that? Yes, we are. Do we need to work to bring other oil and gas companies along with us? 
Yes, we do. It's a horrendous waste of the world's natural resources and a horrendous cause of climate change. Yeah, agreed with that. So maybe just coming back to this issue of um, hydrogen. So you mentioned that um, there's this possibility of using it kind of for steel concrete manufacturing. So, and I guess in this case, all those industrial plants would actually need um, retrofitting of their, their infrastructure as well as building up of, I guess, storage facilities, pipelines and all. So do you think progress is happening fast enough in that space to kind of take in the, the blue hydrogen that Equinor would start producing? That's an interesting question. Two years ago, I'd have said no. I think um, the UK government at the moment does seem to be addressing this. Um, the 10 point plan that they came forward with is one of the most aggressive uh, and, and forward leaning um, in the world. Um, my company's headquartered in Norway. Um, all the power comes from renewable sources in Norway. Um, it's also um, the world's largest user per capita uh, of electric cars. So, you know, you could say, could the UK do more? Yes, it could. Um, it could do even more. Um, I think the real challenge, though, is not a Northern European challenge. I think the real challenge is bringing the rest of the world with us and helping the rest of the world to, to move forward. Until recently, one of the real problems that we had was... Um, that the United States under President Trump um, was pushing fossil fuel policies in a way that certainly we in Equinor feel very uncomfortable with. And that represented an excuse for any prime minister or president anywhere else in the world who didn't much like the idea of moving towards renewables. With the Biden administration coming in, I think we reach a tipping point where it becomes more and more difficult for any government around the world to justify not doing anything about climate change. So I think we have got to a tipping point. Could we do more? Yes, we could. Um, but I would believe that we should focus our efforts on bringing the rest of the world with us rather than simply doing what's best for, the, um, for a, a little part of the world called Europe and an even little part of the world called Northern Europe. So really our efforts have to be on taking the, taking the world with us. At this point, we produce just a tiny fraction of the world's carbon emissions here, and we need to bring the rest of the world um, with us. Agreed. And yeah, on this same kind of idea of policies, um, there's this audience, Corinne, who actually asked, what do you think about the, the Whitehaven coal mine that's not has been refused by the government? So do you actually think that it will then efforts in our journey to becoming zero, net zero? So I'd like to tell you uh, a couple of stories, Karin. The, the first is um, when I was at uh, an energy conference um, just before lockdown, and um, I, I was there with uh, a minister from India, and I was talking about the, the energy transition. And he said something that stayed with me. And he said, I have people that I am connecting to electricity for the very first time in their lives. Families that burn wood. And I'm connecting them to electricity, but the only way I can do that and to afford it is by using coal. Are you telling me, Mr. Cook, that I should not allow those families to be connected to the electricity supply? And this is the great dilemma that we face, which is this twin challenge of the fact that coal for a lot of countries, India, China is the cheapest source of power. The fact that we still have um, millions of people, hundreds of millions, billions of people not connected to the grid. And the only way in which we can connect them to the grid at a low cost is through coal. Now, I, I don't represent the coal industry. Um, I believe that the world needs to eliminate coal power completely. So I'm not saying that we need to do that, but we do need to recognize that this is part of the challenge that um, Sylvester and I were talking about, which is how do we do that over time? And how do we make sure that um, we recognize the needs of, of countries to rise their living standards to the same level that we get in, in the UK? There's a memorable phrase that he and others use, 
which is the developed world, countries like the UK, have gone up a ladder, sat on top of the wall, and they've kicked away the step ladder so the rest of us can't climb up it. The second interesting little story I'd like to tell you about is a conversation with a South African mining company that said, um, if we get rid of mining in South Africa, coal mining, we are going to put thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people out of jobs. We've got millions of people whose livelihood depends on that. How can you speak to them and say you're going to be putting them out of jobs? I tell you those two stories not to make an excuse, but to give you a sense of the challenges that people are addressing here. And these challenges kind of epitomize on this rather tiny Whitehaven coal mine that, um, that, that seems to be getting a lot of attention at the moment. Now, I, I, I think it's rather bizarre, frankly. Um, I'm amazed that they can even make it economic. And to go ahead with a, with a coal mine um, at the moment is to invite vast, vast criticism. Um, there are coal mines a thousand times bigger than this, which I really think we should be worrying about in, in other places in the world. But, you know, it's, it's not my job um, to defend it. I certainly wouldn't. But I do have um, some sympathy for the global conversation around how on earth do you balance these twin dilemmas of trying to raise people out of poverty at the same time as how, how to address climate change. Do I think it will dent efforts to become net carbon zero? Frankly, no, because it's so small. It's, 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 you know, it's negligible on, on, the, um, on the global energy map. It's negligible on the UK's energy map. It's probably even negligible on the Whitehaven energy map. So it is really small, but it is a really interesting little um, example of the broader challenge that the world faces. It's a really good question. I'm not going to defend it, but I do think that it, it, it epitomizes the problem that the world has, even though it's rather bizarre that we found this problem at Whitehaven. And yeah, I guess the, this idea of energy poverty is indeed very significant, as well as this need to look kind of at the, the global picture, the, the broader picture. So I guess a, a big benefit of Equinor's project in, in the UK as well as in Northern Europe, as you mentioned, would be if it can reduce the cost of technology for the rest of the world. So do you actually see, let's say, this um, zero carbon humble project actually contributing to this kind of reduction in the cost of technology so that it becomes more accessible to the world? Yes, this will be the world's largest hydrogen project. We'll use things at scale in a way they've never been used before. And if the world is going to achieve its net zero target, it needs all the tools it can. Um, what we hope is we can take this technology we've developed and we're developing in Humber. Um, we would love to use it in the United States under a Biden government to take some of that gas that's being uh, producing all the, the, all the carbon emissions at the moment and, um, and to uh, start providing America with, uh, with blue hydrogen as well. Now, remember that it costs twice as much as methane. So this is a fuel that rich countries will use before poorer countries use it. Um, so we'll be focusing our hydrogen efforts in the OECD, that's the rich countries, uh, before we, we roll it out gradually um, more, more broadly. But we do believe this is a really, really important way for the world to, um, to address climate change. Okay. And just another question from the audience. So Arthur was asking, um, does Equinor have any plans to kind of invest in vehicle projects? So kind of end use. And what are your thoughts about the future um, for hydrogen cars, considering that there are very minimal refueling points? So Arthur, what, one of the things we try and do in Equinor is work out what we're good at and where we can make a difference. And um, we're not terribly good at working with lots of consumers and we're not, we don't have any track record with vehicles. Um, so that's a place that we work with others. Um, and we often take, we often put some kind of seed, in, seed investments in, in up and coming companies. Um, and that goes for both electric cars and, and hydrogen vehicles. The research that we've done into hydrogen vehicles makes us a little bit worried about them, actually. Our belief in Equinor is that the real uses of hydrogen are going to be on vast industrial scales. Cement kilns, um, 
blast furnaces. And when you look at hydrogen for transport, it's going to be for transporting big stuff. We really believe that hydrogen, possibly in the form of ammonia, clean ammonia, has a big role to play in shipping. We um, were really excited by the idea that we can move ships away from heavy fuel oil, which has been the, the fuel for ships for, for many, many years. We can move that to, um, to ammonia, um, which, is a, which is a form of clean hydrogen. So we actually, we struggle with the belief that um, cars are gonna use hydrogen, precisely for the reason you say. Hydrogen is a pretty tough thing to use. You have to have it very, very cold or immense pressures. And, um, and it costs a lot of money. There are some car companies that are investing in it, um, but we struggle to believe that hydrogen powers are gonna compete with battery powered cars. Um, I had a Tesla and uh, that was a pretty fantastic car. I've yet to meet a hydrogen car that, uh, that is quite as good and quite as convenient as that. So, um, so we're betting on electric cars and hydrogen ships. And just quickly on that, is Equinor investing in any kind of zero carbon shipping projects? Uh, what we're doing, again, we're not terribly good at building ships, but we are good at fueling them. So what we're looking at is, even on the Humber project, we're hoping that we can start producing some of Europe's first um, zero carbon, low carbon ammonia to, 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 to put into ships. It's a much bigger problem because it's a much bigger challenge because right now, if you're a shipping company um, and we say, um, would you like to use our ammonia? Uh, they say, no, we, we, we're perfectly fine using oil. And then we say, well, the rule is in the UK that you won't be able to use oil anymore. You have to use um, low carbon fuels. And they say, well, in that case, we'll go and get our fuel in Estonia. So we're going to have to really bring the world along with us on this one. We see at first some domestic shipping, particularly in places like Norway, um, with a long coastline, um, we should be able to convert some vessels there into batteries and into hydrogen there. And then beyond that, we'll need to work, work, work with, the, um, with the shipping authorities um, for the world in order to move to a place where hydrogen and ammonia gradually replace um, heavy fuel oil as a, as a source of energy for, for boats. But we are optimistic that that will happen over time. And we just need to keep on pushing forward with that. And again, if countries like Norway and the UK get support from countries like the United States, then you begin to get mass and critical mass behind these important changes. Mm -hmm. And you're just briefly going back to, you mentioned how Norway might want to bring a similar hydrogen project into the US, right? So I guess for, for uh, a project in the EU, um, Equinor would actually benefit from the emissions trading scheme because it means that alternatives would be more expensive. So in the US, do you, do you think that this would be quite a big challenge given that there's no kind of federal carbon tax or, or emissions trading scheme? Um, so firstly, you're right on Europe. Europe is moving forward at pace. Um, we believe and we're optimistic that under President Biden, the new policies there will enable the US to really accelerate its transition. We advocate loudly and globally for a world carbon tax. We advocate for carbon taxes in every country we're in. That might seem like an odd thing to do for a company that, um, that uh, has to pay those taxes. But we believe that if we're going to be a successful company, and if we're really going to shape the future of the world's energy needs, we have to work with governments. We have to advocate for measures that will be painful in the short term, but absolutely necessary in the long term. So we hope that in the US there will be some form of a carbon price or some form of a, a carbon tax. In Norway, we have a successful business with the world's highest carbon taxes. We, we pay about $80 if we emit a single ton of carbon dioxide in the UK, in Norway, and that's going up all the time and will ramp up towards 2030. And we are not just satisfied with that, we advocate for that. And we ask countries around the world, please come introduce a carbon tax, we will pay that tax and we will use that money in order to work with you in order to um, produce a cleaner and greener energy mix. So I'm aware that we're coming up to, uh, to, to the hour. I hope I've done a few things. Firstly, I've been very open with the Oxford Energy Society about 
the challenges we face. We can't just click our fingers in the way that my daughter would allow, would love us to, and Greta Thunberg would love us to, and cut away from oil and gas immediately. On the other hand, we've made terrific progress over the last couple of years in Europe. We believe we need to make progress globally, and we are really optimistic that we can. And we are putting our money where our mouth is. We're doing the world's biggest wind farm, the world's biggest hydrogen project, both here in the UK. And we hope that you will come along with us, put pressure on us to go even faster, and encourage us as we move forward and, and lead what we believe is a necessary move for the whole oil and gas and energy industry if the world is going to go net zero as soon as possible. Thanks a lot for that. And yeah, once again, just want to thank you for, for giving us this very insightful talk. So yeah, as well to the audience, thanks for joining us. And yeah, thanks, Al. Thanks for all the great questions. Look forward to seeing you again shortly. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>